Great. Thank you very much, uh, Randy, and, and everyone else uh, who's been associated with putting this together. It's been a great, great project for me. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to start off by telling you a little bit about why I've, I, and, and the Silver City residents all know that um, ACES is something that I, I find extremely compelling and very important. And I, I wanted to share a little bit about my own uh, background, why I think I resonated so strongly to this. And that has to do with, the, I'm, I'm kind of a late life career changer. I became a psychologist later in life. My career prior to becoming a psychologist was um, working in war zones for an international non-governmental organization that worked to defend human rights in, in areas of armed conflict. And I was the project director in Sri Lanka uh, back in 1989 to 91, that area. And uh, at that time, there were two civil wars going on there. And one of the, one of the difficulties that the population was, was running into and some of the people trying to help the local populations was they would bring them economic uh, assistance to areas that had been dramatically impacted by the two wars. And, they, and they, they would complain sometimes that the, that the residents had trouble making use of the assistance that was offered to them. And I met a Dutch psychologist there who was uh, working for Quaker Peace and Service on the island. And she said, well, this is actually a no-brainer. People who have been severely traumatized don't function at the level that they're capable of or, or, or that you would expect of them. And that was actually a critical part of my becoming a psychologist because I, I was, I was uh, inspired by, by the work she did. Um, so, so that's part of why when I got to uh, my training and first ran into the work of Bruce Perry, who um, Dr. Longenecker pointed out that 60 Minutes had a program with Oprah on, on ACES last Sunday, which I was tipped off to by the ACES community. So I looked at it online um, they interviewed Bruce Perry, who's a, a brilliant man. He's both a, a, a developmental psychologist and a, a child psychiatrist. But the main reason I have to say, the main reason I say he's brilliant is because he's organized his life in such a way that he's able to take hikes every morning before he goes to work. And I think that's brilliant, quite apart from everything else. Um, so uh, his, his work was, was looking at the ways that neurodevelopment is, is disrupted by disordered childhood. It's quite separate from the ACEs studies. Um, so I had those two pieces of background. And when I came into contact with the ACEs studies at a conference in San Diego, I saw Dr. Vince Felitti, who was the original um, author of the ACEs studies. Um, it, I had I had scaffolding to put it into, and that, and that, that really triggered the, the passion. So let's, let's go forward to the, the plan for today about why I'm telling this story. And I tell this story frequently as the people in Silver City can testify. Um, so this is basically it. It's just, what are the ACEs? How common are they? Why do we screen? What's the rural take on it? And then there's a really critical part, which is about resilience because resilience you know, no matter how many ACEs somebody has, not everyone with an A score of 10, which is the maximum, has these tremendously negative outcomes. And part of what we learned about what avoids those negative outcomes has to do with resilience. So, and then I'm gonna give you a case study and Martha is not the name of my actual patient, but I'm gonna be presenting an actual patient, so. So first, what are the ACEs? Well, um, they are uh, 10 experiences, in, in, according to the rigid definition, the, the, the rigorous, not rigid definition of, of ACEs, which have been used in hundreds of studies at this point over the last 20 years, since the 23 years since the original study was published. Um, and it's, it's these things it's divided into abuse and then disordered environments. So the, the abuse side are things that we're all trained to report, you know, physical or sexual or emotional abuse uh, or neglect of physical neglect, not getting the things you need or emotional neglect. But then the disordered environment side, those are not reportable uh, abuses. But we know that these experiences between, uh, I, I like to say conception, and I'll explain why I say that, and, and the age of 18, have the same predictive validity as the abuse experiences do. So of the ACE score of 10, what happens, the way you score ACEs is, is you ask someone, did you have any of these experiences in your, in your childhood? Um, and no matter how frequently they had them or how intense they looked from outside, if you had this experience, you get a score of one. And so everyone has a score between zero and 10. And as you know from the, the, the preparation, 
most people have at least one ace. Um, and there are a couple of turning points in that scoring. At, at four, the outcomes start to be dramatically different than someone with an ace score of two, for example. And at seven, life expectancy tends to be 25 years inferior to your age cohort. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter which four or which seven on that list you have. So let's go on forward next. There's another way of presenting this, and there's another uh, beautiful coincidence, uh, Dr. Langenecker, that other than, than uh, 60 Minutes, I, I'm participating this, this week in what's called a, a resilience summit being uh, promoted by a psychologist, uh, Rick Hansen. And his guest yesterday in the resilience summit was Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. <laughs> and uh, so as part of that, I, I stole this slide from her last night <laughs> and slipped it into our thing. It's, I think it's a really nice visual way of seeing what the 10 are what the 10 experiences are. Now I should add here that there, some of the other studies have been starting to add in and, and pointing out that other traumatic events also have this kind of predictive validity. This is the defined ACE study, these 10, but things like um, uh, having, uh, living in a neighborhood where there's lots of violence in the neighborhood. So you're, you're hearing or witnessing or knowing people who have been shot or been attacked. Uh, also tends to, to lead towards the negative outcomes we're going to talk about. Um, living in a society with rampant racism and where you are the target of microaggressions across years, we see that as a kind of toxic stress. So toxic stress is in some ways a larger category of events, experiences, which can lead to the negative health outcomes. But this is the rigorous eighth study 10. So let's go on forward from there too. Um, so what is the frequency? And I, I was pleased in a way to hear the confusion over question number two, because in the original study, and here I, I'm pointing out that in, in many of the follow-up studies as well, the frequency of having four or more experiences comes in at around, the original study was 12.5% out of that, uh, uh, a little over 17,500 adults that, that Kaiser Permanente and the CDC studied in the original study. Um, Dr. Burke Harris last night pointed out that, it, that there's developing evidence that in, in some disadvantaged communities uh, uh, that the prevalence of four or more starts to, to, to tip up to higher levels, up to 25%, in fact, is what she talked about last night. And one of the reasons that we see that is not that impoverished people are, are not as good parents as people who are more privileged. That's, that, that is not something that we can legitimately take out of these studies, but that the behaviors that we develop as a result of being exposed to these kinds of experiences increases the probability of passing it on, an intergenerational transmission of, of ACE experiences, as, you, as it were. But it also increases the probability of, of having uh, behaviors which reduce the probability of success in life. So there's a kind of bi-directional influence there that families that have passed on uh, ACEs tend to have more ACEs because they pass them on as well, the, the, the parenting does. Um, but then if you've been impacted by ACEs, your behaviors may make you more likely to be in an impoverished environment as well or a disadvantaged environment. On the impact side of this, um, I, there's a kind of word cloud there, which is these are this, these are some of the health outcomes which we have very solid findings in the ACE studies for being at increased risk for as the number of ACEs that you've experienced goes up. Um, so and and I, and I intentionally left that word cloud there because it this and this is only a partial list. Let me make that that clear. So it has a very broad ranging effect on health outcomes and life outcomes for people who suffer from ACEs. So let's go on to the, to the next slide, if you don't mind. The, the CDC's, uh, when the original ACE study was published, um, put together a pyramid saying, well, what's the relationship between adverse childhood experiences, these 10 things that we've studied, and the negative outcomes, the, the disease and the disability and the early death that we're seeing? And the original uh, pyramid didn't include that disrupted neurodevelopment second level because we didn't really have a good understanding of it, although Dr. Perry was pointing in that direction already. So, so the original uh, pyramid 
included two arrows that said scientific gaps. And, and the first time I saw Dr. Burke Harris speak, she pointed out, you know, as a good scientist, I hate scientific gaps. So let's figure out what's going on there. And, and that helped lead to this much better pyramid, which helps us understand that being exposed to these experiences creates uh, a kind of uh, interacts, let, let me say that, interacts with neuroplasticity and particularly strong neuroplasticity in early childhood between conception and age six. So the, the actual structuring of the brain and of particular components of the brain will be altered by exposure to these experiences. Um, and we also know now, we'll also have a, a, an epigenetic effect on the expression of genes. So that's why we have this, this new level of disrupted neurodevelopment, which tends to lead towards social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, and then the adoption of health risk behaviors, disease, disability, and early death. So this is a much better uh, pyramid, shall we say, than, than we had originally as a result of the additional studies that have been published uh, since the original study was published uh, in 1994. So, um, let me, let me just pause for a second here and, and, and point out that this it can look like uh, a recipe for this will automatically happen as you have these experiences. And as, as I mentioned, alluded to at the very beginning, uh, that's not actually the case. You know, very large numbers of people with a significant number of ACEs do have negative outcomes. That's why you have such, such um, strong findings, but it's never everyone. And so there's, there's a parallel uh, set of studies going on about how, how do we help protect people? How do we bend the arc of these experiences? Because, you know, by, by definition, if we're, if, we're, if we're screening for, have you had this experience, we can't go back and take those experiences away from you. But we can bend the arc of the outcomes. That's one thing we know from this other parallel set of studies, which are studies of resilience. And so it's not actually a terrible surprise to me that Nadine Burke Harris was in the Resilience Summit, but it was beautiful timing that it was last night that <laughs> she was in it. Um, so anyway, so resilience is one of the reasons that we want to screen for ACEs because it, this is not something that, you know, as if, you know, someone has had a hand amputated, there's not much we can do about it. We could build, you know, give them a, a, something to substitute for their hand this is something where interventions can help bend the arc of the outcomes. So let's go forward. So this is one of the reasons that I'm talking about the screening as a critical component. Um, and in, in my own practice, I, I work in an integrated uh, environment where we have primary care uh, and, and some pediatric care. And, and we've had a, a behavioral health department in, in, in this clinic for the 13 years I've been here. But, um, but we haven't successfully influenced one another on everything, of course. Um, and one of them is I've been screening all of my patients for ACEs for seven years, I believe, something like that. Um, and most of the behavioral health providers screen, but very few of the medical providers have gone to screening. And, and, and some of the pushback I've gotten in meetings about that is, is a dictum that I keep hearing, which is, you know, you don't screen if you can't do anything about it. And, and of course, the truth is we can do something about it. So that, that's one of the reasons I'm pointing it out. Dr. Robert Guthrie, I'm, I'm naming him because uh, Dr. Burke Harris in her book, uh, The Deepest Well, which was just published, it's on the New York Times bestseller list right now, if you, if you, if you know, are so inclined. She has a, a, a chapter dedicated to Dr. Guthrie because he was the person who advocated universal newborn screening uh, and, and, and pointed out that you can really only move the needle on fairly rare or uncommon events by universally screening. You, if, you, if you only screen when you suspect something, you'll catch that, but you're gonna miss people who have it. Uh, we did have a provider here at Hidalgo Medical Services years ago who did start screening for ACEs. And she came to me within the first month, I remember, and saying, I can't believe this. I, I found people who are suicidal who I had no idea were suicidal. And, and I think that's one of the reasons I'm advocating for screening, because if you don't ask, you won't find out. Um, so let's, let's go forward from there again. Um, and Martha, of course, is the case I'm going to bring up to you. So 
So what's the rural study, study story about ACEs? Well, part of it is, um, has to do with the, the therapeutic itinerary for physical health problems and for behavioral health problems. And one of the things we know is that, you know, for people who have significant physical issues, uh, primary care or some form of medical, uh, medical professional is going to be either the first or the second stop on their itinerary of what do I do about this problem I have. On the other hand, for behavioral health issues, uh, a behavioral health professional is typically the seventh stop on their therapeutic itinerary. And that's, that's even more likely in rural environments because in rural environments, um, turns out behavioral health professionals are also rare on the ground and, and collaboration with behavioral health professionals and primary care other than settings that are integrated like Hidalgo Medical Services and most FKCs or patient-centered medical homes is unusual. And on neither side of that divide is collaboration or, or effective integration uh, a go-to response to what we're seeing in the community or what people are bringing in. So um, because the people suffering from ACEs or who have, have gone through ACE experiences and are having the physical health consequences of that are much, much more likely to show up in the, on the, the medical side it's, it's even more important to screen for them because the earlier we can start intervening in, in the, the behaviors that lead to these negative health outcomes, the better the results we have. So there is an increased need for integration, I think, in, in, in the rural environment because you're less likely to have a choice of behavioral health providers you could develop collaborations with or refer your patients to. I also say don't forget transportation, and that's an obvious thing, I think, in most rural environments, um, because uh, it, it, it can be extremely difficult to, to get to effective care. And so some of the initiatives I'm involved with here in New Mexico right now are trying to find ways to bring care and care coordination to the people where they are instead of waiting for them to come to us. Um, resilience is another thing. and and uh, and there's a rural uh, connection to the resilience piece as well. The protective factors, of course, are a sense of connection to other people. We are a, a, an animal which is designed to live in small groups of people we know and care about and know and care about us. That's, that's almost a direct quote from Bruce Perry, one of the, the, the people I've been talking about. Um, having safe places, having places where you get away from the exposure to the negative things and you feel safe is, is extremely important developing meaning, having a way of understanding that this is not just my family, this is not just me, this is a common human experience, and here's how I can make, make sense of this, including for the parents that, um, who so frequently have their own ACEs. And so what we look for are parenting programs, and I'm gonna mention this in just a second, that also recognize the parental trauma associated with, Asian, with ACEs. Because if, if, if you don't do that, it can become finger wagging, like you're an inadequate parent, and that's not likely to be helpful. Um, and, we, and we want to reduce exposure, of course, as, as a, at a community level. We want to reduce how frequently we have ACEs. Um, I've, I have presented on ACEs many, many times in many locations, and in many of them, I screen the attendees at, at my talks for ACEs. And I don't necessarily ask him, have you had these specific experiences? I just present it and say, you know, write down on a piece of paper how many of those you have. And it, at, at many of those, including it, at some with, with groups like law enforcement officers and political leaders, local political leaders, and that the mean score of ACEs was over four. And that really brought home to them that we're not talking about those people. We're not talking about those families that you think of as problem families. We're talking about all of us because this is a common human experience. So resources to look for in your rural environment include parenting programs because one of the things we, that one of the earliest things that came up in the, in the, the series of ACE studies was that a particularly effective intervention at a community level for reducing the community prevalence of ACEs were in-home parenting programs that involved nurses coming to the home and providing psychoeducation about child development 
in that safe environment and, and with a recognition of the parental trauma. So, so that was one of the very first positive in indications coming out of, the, out of these studies. Then you want to look for ways to connect people to professional behavioral health services. So first, you know, normalize the ACEs after you've, after you've screened for them, empathize, bring in a team-based uh, treatment for someone because this is going to be a complex patient. It's not going to be an easy, easy thing. Uh, and then look for behavioral health providers who can provide the evidence-based um, therapies, psychotherapies for helping bend the arc. And, and so I'll, I'll unpack that, that uh, alphabet salad there. CPP is something called child parent psychotherapy. And so as, as, as it you know, implies, it's not working with just the child, um, but it's working with the child and the parent and the family system in a very programmed way. This is a, a powerful evidence-based one. And it's, by the way, it's the one that Dr. Burke Harris uses in her clinic in San Francisco. And then trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is an evidence-based therapy for childhood trauma, which includes the parents. And very frequently, this is one of the therapies I provide, um, leads to treating the parent's trauma as well as the child's trauma and opens up a very safe space to be talking about effective parenting. 